This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a brave new coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Today's podcast is brought to you by Leverage, a new fully featured decentralized futures exchange without compromise. Are you ready to trade the future of crypto today? Well, Leverage is a DEX, so you can trade with your keys and sign orders just with one click, and Leverage is fast. Yes, indeed, Leverage is powered by Gluon, a new layer two solution with the scalability and speed of a centralized exchange and the low, super low fees of a DEX. Yes, Leverage, the new exchange that combines the best features of CeFi and DeFi so you can trade crypto spot or crypto derivatives with up to 100x leverage while maintaining control of your assets at all times. It's like William Gibson said, the future is already here, but in this case, it's evenly distributed and completely decentralized. Go to leverage.io and leverage is spelled L-E-V-E-R-J.io and trade the future of crypto today. All right, let's get on with the show. My guest today is Richard Sanders. Richard is a co-founder and lead investigator for Cypherblade, a blockchain investigation agency. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks for having me. To begin with, Richard, uh, I'd love it if you could perhaps just introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from. I understand that you do actually have a military background with a bachelor's degree in homeland security from the American a military university, which I'm, which I imagine has equipped you with a, a certain set of skills. I'd love to hear a little bit about this. Sure. So um, that's uh, definitely correct about my background. Although I will say um, it's had a degree of influence on the professional path I've taken. I, I will say that the experience I've had in the military and in college doesn't really directly apply to what I do in blockchain analysis in particular. The reason I want to point that out is that a huge gap right now in the industry is that there's so little training that exists for people to do the type of work that, um, you know, the type of work that we do here in Cypherblade or even kind of bigger picture, right? There's, there's not even really good training pipelines set up for compliance officers at exchanges or um, law enforcement professionals that are going to be handling cryptocurrency cases. That is something I'm hoping to disrupt. We certainly wish you uh, lots of luck <laughs> in that endeavor. Well, t tell me then, Richard, how, how did you go from, uh, I guess, you know, uh, working in the, in the military and uh, sort of uh, understanding the, the dark arts of psyops and, and all that good stuff? And then how did you transition into beginning to specialize in the dark arts of, of blockchain analysis? What was the what was the career path there? So it was certainly more than a few things. I will say when it comes to the PSYOP, one thing that's really big with PSYOP in the U.S. Army is we're taught to take unconventional approaches to unconventional problems. And if you look at even to the present day, the state of affairs within anything that involves cryptocurrency crime, cryptocurrency AML, it's really there's a lack of past precedent. And these are often considered, justifiably so, to be unprecedented or unconventional issues so it needed an approach and i just noticed there wasn't an approach being developed for these so you know someone has to write the book someone has to start so utilizing those kind of soft skills i've assisted um law enforcement and writing out some procedures for this and i'm not the only one in it right i mean you've got some other folks like a uh, chain analysis is a great example that are helping pave a path on the how-to here yes that's exactly right well t tell us then what Cypher played actually does Richard so I think we we understand that it's a, a blockchain analysis agency and, and most people will be aware of uh, chain analysis and the work they do but maybe just uh, yeah round out sort of the uh, the the capabilities uh, that, that uh, your organization has yes sir so I'll start with the uh, the one that we're most well known for which is cryptocurrency scam and hack investigations we've become something of the 911 for when people lose money. Um, the ideal thing, which I'm hoping to disrupt, whether it's with uh, retail or individual users or exchanges alike, is I'd prefer if more people started coming to our firm before the fact for security than after the fact saying, I got hacked. 
Um, but that is what we're most well known for is the, the scam and hack investigations. We also provide some services such as security audits and solvency audits for exchanges, security services for high net worth individuals. Um, I, I'm personally spending quite a lot of time as an expert witness on cases involving cryptocurrency. So pretty uh, diversified skill set, but all of this does have bleed over, right? Because at the end of the day, what does Cypher Blade do? We follow the blockchain. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, blockchain detective. Well, what I'd like to talk about today, Richard, you know, the the reason that we began talking and decided to do this podcast is because I, I saw a, a Twitter thread you'd done looking at the, the OKX exchange in China. And obviously there's been, uh, yeah, you know, they stopped withdrawals and there's a whole rabbit hole that we can go down there. And we'll, we'll talk about that soon. Uh, so... There's some other things I, w- I want to discuss as well, though. So to begin with, I'd love just to understand what it means when, because we we hear, you know, blockchain detectives and a blockchain forensics, but to really investigate, uh, you know, blockchain transactions and trace uh, all of these quite sophisticated scammers or bad actors, whoever they are, you need some fairly sophisticated tools yourself. So, you know, anyone who is in a crypto, they will be familiar with a a block explorer. But beyond that, uh, yeah, things get a little bit murky. So I wonder if you could maybe just paint us a a little bit of a picture as to the kind of the, the tools of the trade. Sure. So the best way to summarize the tools of the trade, I mean, most people, when they think of blockchain analysis, they're, they're going to think of chain analysis or maybe cipher trace or elliptic or crystal or tools like that. Ultimately, what those tools are doing is that they're visualizing a blockchain, right? So when you're looking at a block explorer, in a sense, it's doing something very similar. It's taking data that's on a blockchain and putting it into a more uh, visually parsable format. The difference is, is that with these tools, you're, you're getting a graph as opposed to, you know, a page on a block explorer there are some free public solutions for certain blockchains that are that are kind of getting into the realm of visualization so there's other elements of these tools that just significantly increase the quality of life for investigators such as myself as one example of that it would be what's called attribution which is labeling of addresses um, if you go on etherscan you could see some addresses are labeled like some of kucoin's uh, wallets for example are labeled but if you uh, are looking at this in a tool like Chainalysis or CypherTrace, you're going to have a whole lot more attribution, which is immensely helpful on these investigations. Okay. And, and what I do find interesting, Richard, is that, you know, you kind of are a detective, but in a very modern sense. And, and you talked before about how you felt there was a little bit of a separation between your, uh, let's say, the... the the psyops skills that you learnt in the military but as I understand it even today that you know a lot of the work you do on the one hand there is the blockchain analysis but there's also the traditional detective stuff and perhaps a modern setting I'm, I'm talking about you know stuff like like social engineering going undercover and just that combined you know I mentioned that uh, you know that you probably have a, a particular set of skills but let, I'll, I'll use a specific example uh, before we get on to the, the, the murky world of China exchanges so what a famous example is Ian Bellina right so he was uh, a, a quite a high profile and uh, a notorious ICO influencer, I suppose, around, you know, in uh, 2017 and, and 2018. And he, of course, famously appeared to get hacked live on a YouTube stream, if, if my memory is correct. Uh, some people were very skeptical of what happened and, and perhaps thought maybe he was doing some kind of exit scam himself but as I understand it that the hack was indeed legit and uh, you got involved and, and you got on the trail so if you if you could maybe pick up the story how did you get involved and, and what happened next so how I got involved it, it kind of ties into the when somebody gets scammed or hacked Cypherblade became the 911 so you know Ian Bellina experienced that situation had reached out for help on that and um, you know to kind of build off on the topic of, of social engineering or what we often refer to within Cypherblade as off-chain investigation elements, these do come into play. So social engineering there is a great example, right? Uh, I had, as this now unfortunately uh, famous within a Vice documentary, uh, pretended to be a, a female video gamer and, and got one of the individuals responsible for the laundering to 
send me the same selfie with an ID that he sent to Binance when his account there was locked. Um, social engineering can come into play, and in some of these cases it will depend. At the end of the day, the blockchain is the absolute best source of data and information, because if you can follow a trail to a KYC exchange, it, it's not worth sinking a bunch of time into social engineering. Although there are some elements, um, yeah, particularly on the PSYOP side, that can come into play. Or, or this would not necessarily be isolated to PSYOP, but more into the types of experience that investigators and law enforcement would have traditionally. Uh, as a couple of examples, when you're looking at indicators of behavior, right? You're not just looking at a blockchain, but if you're looking at, for example, potential mismanagement, uh, misappropriation, embezzlement, especially with ICOs, if executive staff there have an extensive history of gambling, of speeding tickets, you know that they're not exactly uh, equipped to be making the best decisions. And, and this really predates cryptocurrency as a whole. So there are a, uh, definitely a number of factors insofar as observations of subjects are concerned. Yeah, that's almost, I suppose, uh, detective work 101, but um, you'd be surprised how how uh, useful that kind of those kind of skills can be. Uh, but I... I wonder how the kind of people that are bad actors in in the financial world or or the blockchain space, I imagine they run the full gamut from, you know, just young kids who are messing around for fun right up to, you know, really professional uh, criminal types. So just talk to me about that. You know, uh, how sophisticated are are the, the bad actors in the ecosystem today? And, and are people really prepared to to kind of be able to fend off attacks from, from these kind of attackers? So you've got a wide variety there, as you definitely correctly pointed yeah. out. So you've, you've got your, uh, your, your lowest basket of, of sophistication, which would be a lot of like your telegram or twitter impersonation scammers and a lot of those are based out of nigeria uh, whether it's due to a lack of sophistication or a lack of concern about the npf or the efcc the nigerian authorities taking action on it a lot of them aren't even utilizing vpns they will very rarely utilize mixers sometimes they're they're even using direct deposit addresses for the exchanges they use most often they're going to be utilizing remitano um, th that's your lowest example and then your your much more sophisticated ones will go all the way up to Lazarus right a, a hacking group out of North Korea where you know you're going to have much more sophisticated laundering it could be entire laundering networks utilizing chain hop basically depositing to an exchange switching for a different type of cryptocurrency sending to another exchange just basically to frustrate the resources required insofar as subpoenas um, and it's going to vary a lot at, at the end of the day for you know the end users what they're really banking on for targeting individuals is greed, stupidity, and laziness. And I know that sounds very harsh, but it's the truth. Uh, great example of that, it's 2020, and people still fall for the send me one ETH, I'll send you back 10 scam. And there's you know, tons of public education material out there. I'm not saying that more can't go out on that. But so long as people are not doing their own research, that will still be a very profitable way to conduct this type of crime, right? Um, then you have your more sophisticated breaches, which would apply to some exchanges where, you know, they're more sophisticated and you're going to have to be allocating more into your cybersecurity to combat this. Yeah. And interesting that you mentioned the, you know, that, uh, the notorious, uh, Twitter scams where, you know, you, you say, uh, send, send one ETH here and we'll send you 10 back. And to anyone who's been in crypto for a little while, it just looks ridiculous and, and super obvious. But I think one of the problems, Richard, is just that because the the crypto learning curve or the rabbit hole is so deep and so wide, and you combine that with you know the the simple human emotion of of greed and, and laziness, and that's a that can be a, a um, an interesting mix. And otherwise, normal or smart people can just be caught out by these things because they just uh, don't think twice. And before they think, oh, maybe I should look into this or ask some advice from someone who might have a a, a clue. And before they know it, they're uh, they're gone, right? I mean, absolutely. And at the end of the day, it really boils down to it doesn't help that a significant portion of the industry is truly in it for the money, right? I mean, there's the meme, I'm in it for the tech, but how many does that really truly apply to? And look, I'm not saying it's bad to hold cryptocurrencies as a, a speculative investment, but the 
bottom line is that the majority of folks holding cryptocurrency are speculative investors. They're not actually utilizing it for a use case or involved full time in the industry. Or if they are involved full time in the industry, they're you know, traders essentially. Um, the kind of problem with that is that it paints these unrealistic expectations that just frankly don't help what I like to refer to as Joe Retail. When Joe Retail hears, and these are you know, accurate things like Bitcoin going up, what was it, 1700% in 2017, they think of cryptocurrencies as a way to get rich quick. So it, it's not, and I'm not justifying them, of course, sending funds to these all 10x your ETH types of scams, but... I could understand on a psychological level how it would be believable, right? When you've got people talking about Hex and Forsage, and that is what represents the cryptocurrency community, when new blood comes into the industry, it makes tons of sense that they would become victims of these scams. Yeah, it, it, it certainly does. And you, you published a, a piece on your your website, a blog, earlier this year, Richard. Uh, the, I think the piece is called A Comprehensive Guide to Cryptocurrency Scams and Frauds. And it's quite a long piece. And I just sort of made a, a, a couple of notes of, not, not even all of them, but you've got fraudulent investment funds, pump and dump groups, malware, fake cryptocurrency recovery specialists, OTC scams, broker fraud, peer-to-peer -peer fraud, impersonation scammers, telegram impersonators, hackers and sim swappers, phishing, hard exit scams, fake ICOs, soft exit scams. It is it is a murky world out there, Richard. It can be very murky, and that's why I always suggest the newcomers do your research, allocate your time, and allocate your capital appropriately. And what I mean by that is that look at crypto Twitter as an example. And I know I'm really sounding like a harsh critic of the industry, but it just I, I, it needs to be done. If you look at crypto Twitter, what is the discussion? Price speculation, this new project, DeFi, this altcoin. You very rarely see folks pushing folks into the right direction of, you know, take maybe a 5%, not even 5%, 1% to 3% of your time and just allocate it into how do I properly self-custody? What is a good way to do diligence on a new project, right? Um, a lot of this is just so needlessly preventable at the end of the day is really what it boils down to. Um, I, I see consistent, and I mean truly consistent, deviations from what should be expected behavior at this point, right? And I do, again, have to reiterate right, that this is a needed criticism of new and old blood alike here. but. For one example, if you're setting up a hardware wallet these days, I know if you unbox a Trezor, it has that seed phrase booklet, and it specifically says, write this down, do not store it online. And I can't tell you how many times a week we get an inquiry, uh, well, I had it, you know, my hardware wallet got hacked, or, you know, you don't even need to see our inquiries on this, just look on Reddit or Twitter, people talk about it all the time. My hardware wallet got hacked, and then it's a Trezor or Ledger, Ledger, it's insecure. No. It's somebody not following the instructions. And I know that's really brutal, but you know, the reason I mention this is that the majority of these situations are, are so preventable. Yes, exactly right. And it, it is just up to the individual to, as you say, do their due diligence and put in a, a little bit of necessary work to uh, secure your assets. But uh, anyway, look, hey, let's change tack slightly, uh, Richard, because as much as the, you know, the, the crypto space is filled with uh, a, a number of uh, hackers, both um, basic and sophisticated, as we've discussed. Unfortunately, even uh, you know, crypto exchanges are not necessarily as pure as the driven snow either. Um, so let's talk about the Chinese situation, uh, some of the exchanges over there. Okay, X, slightly complex situation but one of the founders star zoo was apparently detained by chinese authorities and it appeared that because of that detainment uh, the exchange then had to stop withdrawals and they said uh, that they were doing this because uh, one of the private key holders had been detained by authorities for questioning on a separate matter they were they were uh, very keen to to say but of course Stazu was then apparently released earlier this week and exchange withdrawals are supposed to begin in two days time you've got you've had a lot to say about this so your thoughts Let, let's get into it sure so um the, the broader topic of, of cryptocurrency exchanges really is, is a great way to launch off of the conversation that we just finished, which is outside looking in, 
what is the perception of our industry, right? Yep. Um, on the retail and on the trader level, you've got a lot of people that talk almost exclusively about price. And then on the exchange level, you've got a bunch of exchanges that get hacked left and right, um, have lackluster, if even existent, AML programs. And look, I'm not going to sit here and try to advocate nor defend people that assault our industry from a place of no knowledge, right? There are people to include elected officials that quite candidly don't know anything about digital assets and will say, oh, you know, Bitcoin's only used for criminal activity, which is just, as we both know, incredibly untrue. But it doesn't help combating their narrative when exchanges get hacked left and right. Or, you know, as I've pointed out with OKX, there are millions of dollars that are sent directly from illicit sources to an exchange like that especially when it's a big exchange that, that can absolutely bankroll having an effective AML program, it makes us look awful. Yeah, so we'll talk about that a bit, a bit then, Richard. So you have uh, you posted a couple of Twitter threads when I think you basically spent something like half an hour just randomly looking at some of the OKX uh, deposit addresses. And from reading through, you seem to be able to very easily link deposits into those addresses from a variety of dubious entities, including uh, Darknet Markets, uh, like Alpha Bay and um, Hydra, which is the big Russian one. And so I, I guess the, and your point that you're making here is that any exchange that had a, a very rudimentary uh, compliance process in place would pick up these kind of transactions is that correct that's correct so the the launch off of what we discussed earlier about the types of tools that investigators or law enforcement would utilize i also mentioned specifically that compliance professionals with exchanges would utilize tools of that nature and there are actually specifically tools that are designed for compliance professionals at exchanges uh, they're often known as kyt know your transaction tools Chainalysis has one called Chainalysis KYT. Cypher Trace can be utilized for this purpose. So can Elliptic, so can Crystal. And essentially what these tools are doing is they're showing oftentimes, uh, like for example, Chainalysis refers to it as sending and receiving exposures. Most tools have a, an equivalent of that. And when you're looking at these exposures, it's gonna show you this was direct, this was indirect, and it's gonna break it down by category, right? Um, typically dark web markets will be labeled and colored as red. Um, you're going to have peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, mixers, you name it, it's going to have all this different labeling in it. And the purpose of a KYT tool is to bolster an exchange's wider AML program. And these tools, especially for a medium or a large exchange, are not prohibitively expensive, right? They would be expensive for a super small exchange, or obviously they would be out of the cost reach for an end user, deliberately designed that way. But you know, for, for OKX, they could pick up a tool like this for... You know, somewhere between based upon their volume because a lot of these uh, providers of these tools do charge by volume 15 to 30k it is not prohibitively expensive in fact they can pay for it with one day of the uh the trading fees that they take by volume which is mind-boggling because you know i'm not going to pick on okx first here I'll, I'll say kucoin as an example they do these trading competitions and these car giveaways, but they don't have a KYT tool. And then to circle back to OKX, it was just announced, uh, if it wasn't today, it was somewhat recently, it might have been yesterday, that they're going to be giving customers up to $1,000 basically as compensation for the lack of being able to withdraw. Yes. So OKX can bankroll that entire thing, but they can't bankroll a KYT tool? I mean, come on. So if that's the case then, what is the implication of that? Why are they not? I mean, at the end of the day, they would never come out and admit it, but it's pretty clear when you look at the data, why would they not spend what, what to them is clearly based upon the fact they're gi essentially giving money away when they reopen these withdrawals to their customers. They can finance one of these tools, so why would they not want to have one? It's because they know that they're going to get rid of a lot of their dirty volume and make less money that way. Bar none, that's what it is. Yeah, Wow. A uh, murky world indeed. So uh, another comment that you made on, on Twitter, and I thought this was quite interesting, Richard, is that you said that you felt that there was an enforcement arms race uh, coming between, I guess, uh, the United States government and uh, and the authorities in China or the Chinese Communist Party. And 
I guess a, a side note of this as well is that you know we published a, a piece on Brave New Coin around the same time as you were talking about this stuff on Twitter when you know the the OKX uh, withdrawal problem first started and and one of the points that was made in in the piece was that there is this potential angle that the authorities in China are perhaps cracking down on what would you say perhaps you know the 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 tech elite in China so you know uh, Jack Ma of course was um, the the IPO that he was hoping to do that was uh, that was stopped uh, just earlier this month and perhaps there's you know some truth to this narrative but yeah what what are your thoughts on that and what do you mean by this uh, enforcement arms race so I've got a lot of thoughts on that, and uh, I really try not to bring politics into situations like this because I truly do think that you know, while there are going to be inevitable disagreements between a lot of folks in this industry, especially when it comes to things like privacy and AML, I think things that should be unifying factors should be combating laundering of the worst types of evil, um, particularly when it comes to human trafficking or child abuse material. And at the end of the day, um, it's safe to say, despite my... <laughs> typical apolitical stance, I'm no fan of the CCP and vice versa. Therefore, I can't say with certainty that I know more than really anyone in the public would know about why the CCP had apprehended uh, Stardew, right? That being said, um, it is known publicly that, as you have pointed out, Chinese authorities are cracking down on a lot of certain types of individuals in, in their jurisdiction. It is publicly known that this has involved OTC traders. And has been, you know, this has been pointed out by Chainalysis in a report, uh, the rogue OTC report that they put out, where they specify Huobi as a problem. Well, OKX also has a lot of OTC traders, and as I pointed out in a couple of the deposit addresses in my Twitter post, those are rogue OTCs. And basically, Chinese authorities are, are saying, look, just because these are OTCs, not users making deposits to your platform, doesn't waive your responsibility to conduct adequate AML, right? OTCs in the US, they have to register as MSBs and they have to fulfill their obligations, which include doing KYC, counterparty diligence, asking them for a source of funds, right? And whether or not this is going to become the standard in China, I can't say for sure. Of course, I hope it does. But if it doesn't, what's going to end up happening is that exactly what you had mentioned, what I had mentioned, which is that enforcement arms race, right? Um, it's, uh, it's a misunderstanding and I would say a uh, lofty goal for a lot of these exchanges to believe that just because they're incorporated somewhere or domiciled somewhere that they're out of reach of the U.S. government. And I'm also not going to sit here and advocate that the American people or the American government, sorry to correct myself, the American government should be the world police here. In fact, I wish that would not be the case. But ultimately, you know, if the CCP doesn't take action, the U.S. government will. And you know, the, the circle this back to OKX. Just because you know they're domiciled one place, registered another place, doesn't mean that their actions aren't going to be under U.S. government interest, especially if there's laundering from some of the worst types of evil in the world. The U.S. government at that point becomes justified to intervene, especially if that if those actions and they do impact the American people, um, as we've seen recently with Bitmex as an example, which what they did relative to other exchanges is I would opine nothing if you're comparing it in terms of, of scale or in terms of severity um, it, it was demonstrated the US government can reach out and touch that and so ultimately you know at this point it's well within the interests of the Chinese government to take action on exchanges like OKX and Huobi before the US government does absolutely fascinating Richard and and I guess even to put this in a in an even wider macro context it's it's just such a fascinating situation and, and all this stuff is going to play out presumably across the next decade or two. But, you know, you've got on the one side the CCP obviously moving forward, looking like probably the first nation state to launch a central bank digital currency. But And because of that, all these other central banks around the world are conducting their own trials and blockchain research and, and all that as well. In the meantime, um, we have the rise of, you know, decentralized exchanges right which from one perspective you know in a purest form are in theory unstoppable and untouchable from governments although 
you know, in the, in the real world, they can certainly lean on individuals if, if they can find them. So I, I guess it's it, it just, you know, when you talk about this enforcement arms race, it is it's definitely an enforcement arms race. And in an, another sense, it's a it's, it's going to be a, a digital currency war. And then you've got Bitcoin as well, which is just going to keep doing its thing and keep growing and, and size and strength and being unstoppable as well. So it's, 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 yeah, it's going to be an interesting decade ahead, Richard. It certainly will be. And this is probably the last thing you would expect to hear from somebody in my role. But I think DeFi is freaking awesome. I actually love Monero. I love the idea of privacy by default. Uh, what is going to come with that as you know, a, a realist here is that there's going to be an increase in diligence on people that are utilizing these platforms, right? At the end of the day, when you're making deposits to a bank, you're going to have to explain your source of funds. Um, but as long as the public is ready for that, and I think more importantly, the industry is not having conversations about how do we make this work, right? Um, you'll notice that the Monero team doesn't advertise, oh yeah, use Monero for illicit activity, because they don't need to. Monero is awesome, and privacy is awesome, and that is a strong enough use case for adoption in and of itself. Uh, the conversations that need to be had, you know, what would be an amazing idea for a future podcast it would be to have myself and Fluffy Pony talk about how do we make this work? You know, How do we have privacy by default, but also act within the interest of public safety? I'm actually personally strongly against over-regulation, and... The unfortunate thing, as you correctly pointed out, that a lot of these things are, are very slow moving, they could take a decade or more, is that if we don't step up as an industry and start figuring this out ourselves, governments are going to try to do it for us. And that's what scares me. Absolutely fascinating, Richard. And look, well, speaking of Monero, because I'm a, I'm a Monero fan myself, and, you know, what, what do you see is happening with Monero? So if we both agree that it is vital and it's very important to have the ability to make uh, private transactions, but if Monero does, uh, presumably, if it gets bigger and bigger and probably authorities may put pressure on exchanges not to list Monero, and, and I think that's already happened, right? That's already happened with a, a lot of privacy coins and we have seen some exchanges either delist or not list uh, those privacy coins. So does that mean that just that uh, coins like Pri uh, Monero will just go to decentralized exchanges and there'll be this kind of separate private blockchains? Well, I'm hoping that's not the case because, again, I'm a fan of Monero. I, I can't stress that enough. And I would love to see Monero listed on the on-ramps, right? My idea of a cryptocurrency utopia is Monero is listed on an exchange like Coinbase, right? Um, that being said, I, I do think that you know, your assessment of, of where things could go may be the unfortunate reality if this industry doesn't start having the needed conversations, um, which, which basically makes this dichotomy of you've got your your on-ramps, your centralized exchanges, which are going to be expected to continue to have these stringent and even more stringent AML programs, which is going to make it even more difficult for them to interface with uh, either de uh, you know, your DeFi actors or your privacy coins. And it's going to be a real challenge from there. Ultimately, I think at the end of the day, we need to be a lot more forward thinking, right? Um, there, There is not going to be a lot of past precedent in all this. There, there is some that we can draw from, right? So for example, obviously I'm no fan of the banks and yeah, you know, people within this industry often point out the parallels of, well, you know, cash can be anonymous, but to this date, there has never been a way to conduct unlimited, completely unlimited, and as much frequency as you want, anonymous transacting instantly or near instantly. There's no precedent for that. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but how do we work around it? Yeah, well, to play devil's advocate then, Richard, how would you make the argument, perhaps, let's use the U.S. as the example, what would be the argument to U.S. authorities and, you know, the the IRS and, and the FBI, who I know you uh, uh, work with a lot? So what would the argument be to those kind of organizations to make it possible to uh, allow the likes of Monero on centralized exchanges and, you know, kind of part of the, the, the fiat on-ramp system? So I would look both ways on that. I, I wouldn't look just at authorities, but I would look at our industry and a spe specifically the end users as well. So uh, let's start with the authorities front first. To state the obvious, the, this dragnet surveillance, we, we want to be able to look at everything all the time. And that's not going to work. I'm never going to stand for that as a privacy advocate for myself. Um, kind of flipping it back to realistic expectations here, though. Think about what is currently expected of 
cryptocurrency users in the U.S. As, you know, they have to file taxes, obviously. What comes with that? You're, you're submitting uh, essentially substantiating stuff for you know your trades, and you have to be as really prepared to substantiate your transactions in the event you're ever audited. Record keeping, right? What was the purpose of this transaction? This, uh, you know, if you're a peer-to-peer -peer trader, who did you transact with? When? Why? Right? Having all those answers ready is something that I think is the appropriate balance. And as long as the perception changes that cryptocurrency users are responsible and start doing that, it's going to be a lot less justification for this, uh, this essentially what's become paranoia of privacy coins, of DeFi, and really more broadly of decentralization. Very interesting. Okay, well, let, let's just cover off a, a couple of other points I wanted to make on in terms of exchanges. So just wanted to quickly touch base on, on Binance because a, a lot of people give Binance a, a hard time. You know, they, uh, they've been a, a little bit, uh, shall we say, shady in terms of, you know, where they say they are based or, or registered. And look, I mean, a, a lot of exchanges are, are like that. But I gather that you see Binance as, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll let you, yeah, what, what's your take on Binance? Are they a good actor? To summarize it quickly, I would say yes. It's obviously more nuanced than that. Um, Binance and even CZ know that I will criticize Binance and CZ himself when appropriate, and I will give them compliment when appropriate. I say they're a good actor because, in, in my professional opinion, they have an effective AML program. Right? Is it 100% perfect? No, but neither is any AML program for any exchange. But at the end of the day, Binance has historically always utilized the KYT tool from the onset that they were available. Um, at a point, they had utilized Chainalysis, and you know, th these are all public announcements. They announced that they were working with CypherTrace. Um, having one of those tools, I, I mean, that is the bare minimum, as we mentioned earlier, to have an effective AML program. That's just an absolutely needed part of it. The reason I say Binance is a good actor, or the reason I have a good impression of them overall, is that they're present in industry self-regulatory organizations, such as Crypto Defenders Alliance, whereas some other exchanges are not. The other reason I'll give Binance props is that out of all of the exchanges that we communicate with within our investigations, um, whether it's you know just tipping them off to some stuff that might be handy for them to know to bolster their AML program, industry insight kind of things, or even our investigations working with law enforcement, they are by long and far one of the most responsive exchanges. Do they get dirty funds? Of course they do. Every single exchange does. And that's going to be incredibly much more so when you have a KYC light or a KYC less element to your service. So what I mean by that is that Binance offers a, a no KYC account level up to two Bitcoin withdrawals per day. Inherently, what's going to come with that is bad actors. Here's the thing on that, though. And this kind of ties into I'm a realist, but I'm also a privacy advocate, and it's a tough balance. If Binance felt the pressure or were even mandated to get rid of their you know, optional KYC, if they were mandated to have KYC, I could tell you as an investigator in cryptocurrency cybercrime what would happen. The volume from those actors is just going to go to other exchanges that are less compliant. And there are other exchanges that will put up these deliberate obstacles to um, industry experts such as myself or even the law enforcement just to make it uh, needlessly difficult to, to push forward an investigation. Whereas Binance, you know, despite the fact that you, know, you are going to have bad actors that will send to these freshly generated Binance accounts, they are incredibly responsive. And it's actually almost more often than not that we're able to get funds frozen at the Binance exchange. I can't say that for a lot of exchanges. Very interesting. Okay, here's, here's another thing that, that happened uh, this week. It was quietly announced that Coinbase is going to cease margin trading, uh, apparently due to recent regulars, re, apparently due to recent regulations by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the CFTC. Any thoughts on, on the background there? What might be happening? So this is purely speculation, because I've seen a lot of the same headlines you're talking about. I haven't read into it too deeply. Um, this is a good example of the type of thing I fear, where you know, government, or I'll even use the, the phrase that I almost never use, which is Big Brother, has a concern that all of this fresh blood coming in is just not responsible enough to handle uh, you know, that type of trading. That That's really ultimately what it boils down to, right? That's why a lot of what the CFTC does is done with that in mind. 
Um, Coinbase, because of the fact that you know they, they've got such heavy U.S. footprint and they are essentially the on-ramp within the U.S., right? They're going to fall under a lot of scrutiny from regulatory agencies. A am I saying one way or another that it was the right choice for Coinbase to do that? Well, not necessarily, but I say what I'm saying is that I understand their reasoning for it. Yeah, okay, I think that makes sense. You, you've also talked a lot about users should demand proof of solvency and, and proof of security, right? Which is, you wouldn't think it's a big ask, but in today's world, a, a lot of exchanges and crypto companies and services probably aren't living up to that. And, and a, a good recent example is, uh, I think, the US company Cred. Is it a US company? You know the one I mean? They were sort of one of these uh, crypto lending services. The interest bearings. Yeah. yeah. And so how should these companies or how should we go about demanding that proof of solvency it's another way of saying proof of keys right and it's it's a worry that you know if there was ever kind of some kind of uh you know the equivalent of a, a bitcoin run on some of these services you know some could potentially get caught with their pants down absolutely it's a great question and i'm really glad that you're asking that um the short answer well, let's start with solvency is that there's no one size fits all solution for solvency on that and the reason i mentioned that is that exchanges are all ran in different ways and what will work for one exchange won't work for another. And, and that is especially true when you're talking about comparing an exchange to like a, a platform like Cred or, or Celsius or BlockFi or any of those. Um, but at the end of the day, what is shared across all of them is that verifying solvency is possible. And I'd love to use Kraken as an example because what Jesse Powell did with that, what we're having that publicly verifiable proof of solvency is awesome. It's highly innovative. And the fact that it hasn't been replicated in some way, shape, or form it is just depressing to me. Um, you don't necessarily have to go for, you know, something that's uh, the route that Kraken did, right? Uh, Bitbuy, a Canadian exchange, a small Canadian exchange, had us verify their solvency. Getting a trusted third party to, to do it is by no means prohibitively expensive. There's no reason it can't be done. I mean, these exchanges can all afford it. The reason why it's not getting done is because users aren't demanding it, right? And it really ties back into, I know it sounds really brutal earlier, but if you think about it now, it's gonna make a ton more sense. If users were not utilizing exchanges that did not verify their solvency, then the demand for the solvency and ultimately exchanges verifying it, it would start happening. But it's only going to happen, unfortunately, in one of two ways. Governments mandate it, or exchanges or uh, users of exchanges essentially force their hands to do it. And I know what the outcome I would prefer is I don't want government to have to say exchanges, you have to do this because then they're going to, you know, as they tend to do, mess it up, overregulate. So it's so important, you know, that the broader industry isn't just looking to Chainalysis or, or Cypherblade or Cyphertrace or any firms like mine to force these exchanges hands because we can't. Yeah, and this is, of course, why, you know, the DeFi guys and the DeFi is so exciting and, and interesting because everything is on-chain and transparent and verifiable, and that's kind of one of the, you know, the, the core tenets of blockchain, right? So it is a little bit disappointing that some of these uh, other services are black boxes in, in the kind of the old school uh, way when uh, that's not really what blockchain is about. Well, exactly. And that's kind of the, the tragic irony of this technology. Uh, you know, you flash forward to 2020. Yeah, like we've got some change. DeFi's hopping and popping now. But, you know, history might not repeat, but it rhymes. Look at 2017 ICOs that, that raised tens, hundreds, or, you know, in the case of EOS, billions of dollars. Can anybody say for a lot of these projects what the money ultimately went to? And that answer is no. You've got some project like, um, like Dash or Energy where... It's very transparent. Here is what we're spending funds on. They'll even include like you know votes on what makes sense to spend funds on. Whereas these ICOs that that'll raise tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, they put out these white papers and they say we're going to allocate 50% of these funds into development. And it's very clear, even to someone that's not a developer like myself, there is no way they spent those tens of millions of dollars on development. They outsourced it to some company, spent about half a million dollars on it, and in reality, they pocketed the money for themselves. All of this is solvable by the very technology that they're building their solutions on. That is the real tragic thing about it, and it's still happening with DeFi, right? Uh, well, this amount of the tokens goes to the team, or we're going to use this for operational expenses. 
there's no reason why it can't be public about what are those operational expenses. Even if you want to keep your team anonymous, you know, we can have another discussion on that, but just showing what is the money being used for and is this business effectively being ran in a way that makes sense. Yes, indeed. I want to put a quick a break here, Richard, just to, to break it up and pay the bills. Uh, but we'll come back very soon. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Taylor Swift, your workstation and your computer specs. That will be interesting. And we'll even see if we can finish off with the crypto conversation hot deck around back in one sec. Are you ready to trade the future of crypto today? Introducing Leverage a full-featured decentralized futures exchange without compromise. Leverage is a DEX. Trade with your keys and sign with one click. Leverage is fast. It's powered by Gluon, a layer 2 solution with the scalability and speed of a centralized exchange and the low fees of a DEX. Say goodbye to exchange hacks, front-running, Ethereum network congestion, and high gas fees. Leverage, a new exchange that combines the best features of CeFi and DeFi so you can trade crypto spot and derivatives with up to 100x leverage while maintaining control of your assets at all times. Like William Gibson said, the future is already here. But in this case, it's evenly distributed and completely decentralized. Go to www.leverj.io and trade the future of crypto today. For crypto indices and benchmarking, Brave New Coin's powerful indexing engine can calculate high-frequency intraday and end-of-day indices for a wide range of index products. Brave New Coin's custom indices team delivers experienced consultancy, premium data, and trusted calculation. Contact BNC today to find out more. All right, we're back and I'm with Richard Sanders from Cypherblade, the blockchain investigation agency. Uh, Richard, I couldn't help but notice on, on your Medium bio, just to change tack slightly, you say that you do bad things to bad people, which I love, and that you're a Taylor Swift fan. And in fact, the, the image on your your Twitter header is a Taylor Swift meme. Uh, are you a, tw- a T-Swift fan or is this a psyop to throw us off? Can the answer be both? Because I would say it's a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes sense. And you're in, you're in quite good company because I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, the Swift on Security Twitter account. I was just going to say that that's actually inspired by yeah, that. I so th- I thought it might be very interesting. Okay. Uh, I said we'd talk about your workstation. I, and there's a, a fantastic blog um, that, that you wrote. I think it's from 2019. So I, who knows? Maybe it's, it's out of date right now and look I'm not too much of a, a, a gear nerd myself but and I'm not, not sure how much you want to reveal but um, for, for any gear nerds that are listening just talk us through I- anything that you can say about you know what kind of specs you're running and you know what kind of workstation do you have and, and how, how are you operating? Sure. So uh, that blog post is admittedly outdated. I should, when I have some time, update that because I've got a couple of cool new toys. Um, but you've got to have a good workstation, whether it's for jamming out. If you're a, if you're a Swifty, such as myself, you got to have some good speakers to make sure that you really can appreciate her yes. music. Um, but yeah, you know, one thing, and this is really more so coming from my time at Google, where my job was to make sure that the workplace was so awesome to work at that people would never want to leave. I think that in terms of quality of life, and I, I see this from a lot of folks in the industry. If you go across Twitter, people tweet out, you know, our office got upgraded or people are showing their you know, work from home offices. It's so important if you spend, you know, think of it like this. So the best advice I've ever gotten is that you're going to spend a third of your life sleeping and a third of your life working. You should have an awesome bed and you should have an awesome workspace, hands down. So, you know, what is the tech that can get you there? For me, you know, because of the nature of the work I do, having a gigantic monitor, huge, huge help. If you're spending a lot of time in front of a computer having a standing desk, that really helps. Uh, good headset, I mean, to state the obvious, you know, good headset and mic if you're on a lot of meetings, very, very helpful. Really, really good keyboard and mouse. I mean, again, it's just these are things that really sound trivial, but they really add up to making your life a lot better when you're doing this type or really any type of work. You said at the end of that blog post that the entire workstation area is secured with tamper-evident traps, cameras, and other interlinked features powered by hidden plane-in-sight Raspberry Pis, and 
what and then you just say that oh perhaps i'll do a future post on this but for now let's just say that owning a 3d printer knowledge of varied trade craft and sternography make this environment a nightmare for anyone foolish enough to try me could you put that in plain english what are you talking about there richard <laughs> Sure. So um, obviously I can't reveal all the tricks of the trade, but I will say, you know, this this could apply to anybody. This doesn't have to apply to somebody that's you know, an investigator or gets targeted like I do. Um, Joe Retail that puts a significant amount of their life savings into digital assets. Think about where should you store your, you know, your seed phrase, your seed phrases, for example, um, a fireproof safe on steel. You know, that, that's a good bet but maybe you don't necessarily need a safe. Maybe you could have something that's bolted into the wall that's hidden in plain sight. Um, just to use a couple of examples here, not confirming nor denying, these are things that I use, but um, a historically well-known one, carved out books. Uh, you mentioned 3D printers, which, which uh, before you even said that word, I was gonna use as an, as an example. You can print things that are very inconspicuous, uh, shelves where you could store keys in. Um, yeah, the list goes on and on. It, essentially, you know, not everyone's going to need to live with the level of OPSEC that I do, but if you spend you know, a very small, relatively, amount of money and time into this, you can make getting yourself hacked or having things stolen from substantially harder. Yeah, I, th I think that's good advice, and, and we'll look, we can certainly do a, a full show on that, and perhaps we should at, at some point, Richard. Uh, just I would love to because frankly it's just it's plain fun right yeah. uh, even for somebody that does this stuff regularly like i do yeah. um it, it's a it's a fun topic to talk about and for people that don't do what i do every single day taking some time and getting creative on this just can be a really really interesting experience couldn't agree more well look i'll, I'll take you up on that richard I'd, I'd love to have you back uh just to really do a, a a deep dive into some security stuff uh as we start to to finish off i just had a couple of fun questions here and then and then we'll do the the crypto conversation hot take round but um you describe yourself as a realistic libertarian contrarian cyborg which again i, I just i enjoy that what what is what do you mean by that well, I'll, I'll start with the cyborg one because that's easier. I do have some metal in me from some injuries, but won't get too much into that. Uh, realistic libertarian contrarian. So I, I think that you know, at this point of the podcast, a lot of that's probably coming together, right? I'm not an anarchist, right? And I know one question you often ask is, you know, dystopia, utopia. I, I don't think that it's viable for a world to exist where governments don't exist and there's no regulation on digital assets. On the other hand, as, as I've expressed on more than a few occasions throughout this podcast, one of my biggest concerns and something that quite literally keeps me up at night is government incompetence and regulation. So, you know, it, tying all that together, that's why I would describe myself that way. I want to, as much as possible, avoid over-regulation by governments. At the same time, I know a little bit too well about the evils that exist in the world, and there do have to be some stop gaps to mitigate those evils. Very interesting, Richard. And yeah, it's, it's funny you should mention this because before we're talking today, right, so I'd obviously done a little bit of research on your background and you know, once once I've, I've seen that you've spent all this time in the army doing some, you know, some fairly gnarly stuff, and then you're doing quite gnarly stuff now, and you you obviously work really closely with uh, the likes of you know the FBI and all that. So I thought maybe this guy's like a real hard ass military guy, but you are not. You also uh, appear to be a, a, a true. Um, uh, crypto advocate in, in the purest sense as well of course as, as being a Swifty so you know I, I find that fascinating but yeah I, I'm interested to, to hear more on your thoughts on I, I think I can't remember what you said but you know the the incompetence that that is just ingrained in some of these government institutions right yeah and it, it's a very poor reflection upon in, in some cases directly in some cases indirectly who we elect into office right but at the end of the day, I mean, there, there's thankfully an increasingly larger number of, of competent officials that, that can speak at least somewhat well-versed about these issues. But, you know, Brad Sherman's a great example, right? Uh, what does that guy know about cryptocurrency? E evidently not a whole lot. Um, I, again, my concern is this technology has so much potential. And if it's not obvious, I'm not the biggest fan of talking about my military background, although I will because I know it's... Um, yeah, an interesting and relevant point to a lot of these things. 
what I will say about war in general, and I hate talking about war, I don't want anyone to have to, to see some of the stuff I've seen there, right? And I, I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you that blockchain technology is going to prevent all war in the future, but I'm a firm believer in that an increase in transparency, which also includes government, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, can result directly and indirectly in a decrease in war and a decrease in needless expense and to stunt that potential because we're not stepping up as an industry to you know police ourselves before government does is really tragic very interesting okay last last question i just want to ask you before we do the hot take round i'm just because it's 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 a one of the big narratives at the moment is you know we've got bitcoin is around uh, 19k at the moment it's about four percent shy of the all-time high and you know i think it's fair to say that you know most bitcoiners and, and the crypto industry as a whole are quite excited and, and looking ahead to uh, potentially some kind of uh, big bull run in 2021 so I, look I, I imagine you're not too keen to speculate on on price movements or or any of that kind of stuff but there's also this narrative of you know the the potential bitcoin supply crisis just because there's obviously there's only 900 new bitcoin being mined today following uh the halving back in may and of course you will have seen the headlines you know we've got the entities like square paypal and and grayscale just to name three which combined buying now is probably uh they would be buying more than the the daily uh, new bitcoins issued daily into the system so just wondering if if you sort of keep an eye on this stuff from a a blockchain analysis uh, point yourself so i'll start by saying you're absolutely right i'm not going to be the one to price speculate That being said, um, a blockchain analyst such as myself or, you know, folks working with a firm like Chainalysis, we do pay attention to things like the supply of freshly mined coins because that does come into play as just one kind of small example here with where our OTC is sourcing their coins from, right? That was a very relevant conversation when it came to the topic of OKX or Huobi. A lot of their OTCs involved buying from miners. Um, can or will that affect price? I mean, I'm sure that's a whole more extensive conversation, but yeah, at the end of the day, the reality is, is before even looking at price, right? We have so many conversations that we need to have as an industry and it's going to sound brutally honest, but yeah, the best way I could summarize answering that question for you is that if you want the price of digital assets to, to grow, I think the most important thing is let's make sure this industry has a very positive perception so we can get to where we need to be with actual adoption. And at the end of the day, even if all you care about is price, well, then that should be justification in and of itself. That will appreciate the price. A, a, a very diplomatic and, and sensible answer, Richard. I, I appreciate that. All right. Look, uh, as I think you know, I like to finish each podcast with a, a quick round of rapid fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Absolutely. Let's do this. Just want your hot takes, your hot fire, Richard. Take your best shot. Here we go. Answer them any way you like. Richard, where do you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a maximalist for any type of cryptocurrency. I think that innovative solutions have their place. Whether they're a layer or their own coin is subject to the particular solution. Monero. Monero, Richard. Monero. Okay. (laughs) Richard, what would you say is your firmest conviction XMR crypto opinion firmest conviction XM or firmest conviction trying to put the answer to my head here uh firmest conviction crypto opinion uh reliability or i'm sorry uh self custody and self responsibility and what i mean by that specifically it doesn't apply just to joe retail but it starts with joe retail if we set a precedent where we can truly live and embrace be your own bank uh, the largest challenge really our industry has to overcome is the centralized protections that, you know, they're, they're double-edged swords that as a society we've been coddled by for, for decades or even centuries now. If we can overcome that, we're going to gain so much more insofar as giving power back to the people. Fantastic. Uh, let's change tack slightly, Richard. Uh, UBI as a potential fix for AI-induced automation and perhaps even slightly controversially, perhaps as a, a fix for a, a future world if, if, if inequality just keeps growing uh, the way it will. Thoughts on UBI? 
So I'll, I'll preface it with saying this, that there's a lot of folks in this industry that want to come off on experts and things that they are just frankly not experts in. Um, I, I am not somebody that's, you know, worked for a financial institution. I'm not even a, a trader. Most of the people listening to this podcast have probably conducted more trades in a week or even a day than I have in a lifetime. Um, that being said, I'll answer the question. It's just I want to make it clear I'm not a subject matter expert on that topic, and I think that people in this industry would do well to replicate that objective approach. On the topic of UBI, I, I think that, and I'll even say this as a libertarian, there is some possibility with it if it's a blockchain-based solution. Um, it requires a, a lot of discussion and a lot of planning and an agile approach. Um, but it's something where, again, this really ties beautifully into avoiding government overregulation. Not something we really want governments involved in, right? Um, to kind of move it away from cryptocurrencies as an example, um, there are some countries where, you know, um, socializing the healthcare system has worked well for them, right? I don't think it would work well in the U.S. And if anyone wants to disagree with me on that, they're more than welcome to take my health care from the Department of Veterans Affairs. A very nuanced answer, Richard. All right, we'll keep it moving. Bill Gates famously said, of course, that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So look, at pure speculation and choose anything you like, blockchain, Bitcoin or, or something else. But what does it look like in, in 10 years time? I'll, I'll stick with the industry, what it could look like in 10 years time. That That's going to sure. be entirely dictated by the actions this industry takes. And, and I can't emphasize enough when I say the actions this industry takes, that is anything from exchanges deciding to starting to self-regulate and police themselves to Joe Retail, who, you know, works a standard nine to five and has a few thousand dollars in Bitcoin or other digital assets starting to speak with their money. So, you know, if there's more responsibility from Joe Retail and you know, the industry broader. I think that it's very viable that you know, 10, maybe 15, 20 years time, we're utilizing cryptocurrency or not even just cryptocurrency, but blockchain solutions every single day. I think that this industry has the potential to be, yeah, you know, think back, wow, I'm getting old. It's uh, 2020. Think back 30 years ago, right? Or not even 30 years ago, because I was born 30 years ago. Think back 15 years ago, right? Did most people think that they would have a device that they just put in their pocket where you know, you're looking at you know, somebody's lunch or, or somebody's cat? No, because it was so much more complex back then. You had to understand things like IP addresses and JPEG files. Nowadays, you just open an app and it's there. I think blockchain tech has the potential to get to a point where people utilize it every day and they don't even understand you know, what, what a Ethereum transaction is. I could see us getting there. Yeah, exactly right, Richard. We just get to, you know, we'll get to the point where uh, no one will really even think about the fact that they're interacting with blockchains. Everything will just happen on the back end. And I guess it, it kind of relates to the next question, which of course is from a quote by sci fi author William Gibson, who of course said that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So, can you think of an example, Richard, of the future being here right now, but but most people just aren't really aware of it? Sure, that's a real simple answer, and it doesn't require a, a yep. more complex answer like the other ones I've given. Cryptocurrency. I yep. mean, bottom line, it, it, I mean, it's here, right? Um, is it perfect? No. You know, is it to a point where you could easily utilize Bitcoin to pay for coffee? I know people would disagree with this answer, but no. I know there's different layers that exist. Um, but, you know, insofar as storing value and so far as much more so than storing value transferring value it's here now right if, if the intention is to utilize some type of solution to transfer value that is doable right now with cryptocurrency and most of the world doesn't realize that quite yet yes indeed okay well time to get weird richard i've been weird this whole time you know that <laughs> <laughs> Let's zoom out slightly. What do you see as the long-term future for the human race? And I know you did allude to this earlier in the show, but uh, uh, long-term future, do you see dystopia or utopia? You know, my hope is that, and I was anticipating the, uh, the dystopia versus utopia question, despite the fact that um, in addition to the war experience, I really try not to talk about too much. I'm sure you could also imagine I, I and continue to see some of the worst of humanity on a fairly regular basis, right? In the course of 
some of the investigations that we do, and myself in particular, in partnership with law enforcement, uh, child abuse material is one. That stuff actually haunts me more than anything from the wars. I think that most people are naive to that stuff existing in the world, and I'm not saying that they're they're bad for it. I, I truly envy them, right? Um, I, however, I think that their naivety to these things prevents them from understanding the importance uh, of striking this balance, right? I, I, I don't think the question is, you know, dystopia versus utopia. I think those are both very extreme outcomes. I think the, ba the, the better question really is how do we stop our world from blowing itself up while keeping as many people as safe as possible while also preserving privacy, right? Which also is essentially included within that same question of how do we keep as many people as safe as possible? Yeah, a really good answer, Richard, and, and a lot going on there. And uh, look, not to get too uh, too dark, but I, I guess it's just, you know, you talk about seeing the, the, the worst sides of, of human nature, and I think that's just that's just one of the problems is, that, you know, I, I talk about this as well. You know, we are really just biological animals, and unfortunately, uh, some of those uh, biological urges that people have can, can lead to really dark places. How, how do you deal with with that is that do you know do, not and I'm not being flippant here but you know you, you put on some Taylor Swift and, and tune out the the bad stuff or how, how do you deal with that just to be clear you're asking how I deal with it on a personal level or like how would society deal with it on a personal level because I don't think anyone well if you think you've got a, an idea to, to solve it on a society level I'd love to hear it I'll start with a personal one um, a, a lot of the same solutions that I, I utilize for really any type of stress or trauma would apply to stress or trauma for, from my current role, right? So things that have worked well for myself, for my veteran peers, uh, surprisingly meditation has been one. And if you would have asked me five years ago, if I would have been meditating twice a day, I would have looked at you like you were dropping acid, but it actually works incredibly well. Um, another good one is rest, right? I mentioned earlier that you spend a third of your life sleeping and that some of the best advice I've ever gotten is making sure that you have a fantastic bed set up. I mean, that's huge. Uh, light hygiene, diet, hydration. These are all things that they sound complex, but they're, they're really not, right? Um, I'm a big advocate for avoiding medication. For some people, it, it is chemically necessary, but yeah, you have to think of all these things. Uh, really, the best advice I've ever gotten for these things is that you have to think of it like tools in a toolbox, right? There's no such thing as a tool that is going to fix everything, but some combination of some amount of tools will solve most problems. Very good advice, very good advice. All right, and finally, Richard, let's finish this off. What is your favorite science fiction book, film, show, or universe? Ooh, I have to pick just one. That is a, uh, that, that one actually put me on the spot as opposed to all the other ones. Um, I'll go with a generic one just because I want to give you an answer without keeping you waiting for the next five minutes while I, I deliberate and fact check. <laughs> uh, I'll go with Star Wars and the reason for that is that it has a special place in my heart because on my dog tags I had my religion as Jedi and that actually made a, a particular Sergeant Major incredibly upset at one point and, and tried to get me to, to change it but ultimately uh, <laughs> the battalion commander said I'm allowed to do it. Oh that's brilliant, I love that. And what's, what's your whiskey of choice? Uh, I like lead slingers. Yeah, veteran-owned companies are ones that I try to support where I can. Very nice. All right. Hey, look, Richard, this has been an absolute uh, pleasure to talk to you. I've, I've really enjoyed it, and, and I would love to have you back to maybe talk more about the security stuff. And I feel like we've only really scratched the surface of, of everything that we've uh, talked about today. But... Um, We'll, uh, I'd certainly love to do it again but for now uh, take us out I'll hand the microphone back to you and, and perhaps if you could just tell the people uh, where they can go if they want to find you on your various platforms and even perhaps an, engage your services uh, at Cypherblade Sure, so I'll simplify that equation instead of rattling off 10 different links if you go to cypherblade.com it's got a link to our contact form it's got a link to our social medias if you want to follow me individually, you could go to twitter.com slash raindropactual. That's my handle on there. Excellent. All right. Very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Richard. All the best. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for covering these really needed topics. I hope that others can take a, a note from what you're doing here. And again, also, not just a shout out to you, but a shout out to the listeners too. By, by listening to a podcast covering these topics, you're doing more than what a lot of the you know, your industry peers are doing. So keep up the excellent work. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.
Okay, well, there you go. Thank you to Leverage for sponsoring the podcast. Leverage is a full-featured decentralized futures exchange without compromise. So if you're ready to trade the future of crypto today, Leverage is for you. It's a DEX and it's fast because it's powered by Gluon, the new Layer 2 solution that supports the scalability and speed of a centralized exchange with the low fees of a DEX. Yes, Leverage, it combines the best features of CeFi and DeFi so you can trade crypto spot or crypto derivatives with up to 100x leverage and you maintain control of your assets at all times. So go to a leverage which is L-E-V-E-R-J dot I-O and trade the future of crypto today. All right. That's us. We are out of here. Don't forget, if you did enjoy the show, please do feel free to give us a five-star rating and even a nice review in uh, Apple iTunes or the Apple Podcasts app. would certainly appreciate that. Uh, bye for now. See you real soon. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave and New Kind.